this is a forgery. For the real thing, come to the Abraham Lincoln Bookshop in Chicago. Welcome to Virtual Book Signing. I'm Daniel Weinberg, and we're at the Abraham Lincoln Bookshop in Chicago as usual. So don't forget, if you're watching the archive, we'll probably have books for you still to purchase, first editions and signed. Today we have two wonderful uh, authors who have been steeped in the medical aspect of the Civil War, and I think you're going to find this fascinating. Uh, first of all, Shauna Devine, with her book, Learning from the Wounded, The Civil War and the Rise of American Medical Science. Uh, she is a visiting research fellow from the Department of History of Medicine. Is I'm not sure I'm pronouncing this correctly, Schulich School correct. of Medicine and Dentistry at Western University uh, in Toronto. She's a member of both of our authors here are members of the Society of Civil War Surgeons. And so this is a University of North Carolina Press book, 372 pages, illustrated. And your 12-year-olds will love the illustrations. <laughs> <laughs> and it's thirty nine ninety five. As well on our program today is Gordy Damon, uh, whom many of you know already, I'm sure. He has a practice of general dentistry in Lena, Illinois. He's the chairman of the board of the National Museum of Civil War Medicine in Frederick, Maryland, a collector of Civil War medical artifacts, and he's displayed those at numerous Civil War shows, won many times, uh, awards for that, and also at presidential libraries, the Hoover, the Reagan, and Ford libraries. He has today a one-day dispensation in this bookshop, even though he's a Packers fan. <laughs> uh, yes, but we one day only. <laughs> and he is the author uh, of the three-volume Pictorial Encyclopedia of Civil War Medicine, Medical Instruments, and Equipment. Uh, these are done by the Pictorial Histories Publishing Company, they're $9.95 each, and if you want the set, uh, you can get that for uh, $26. We've uh, come down a little bit to help you out on that. And uh, these, the sets will be signed, by the way, on the first uh, volume only, as all sets are. And this is just wonderful with also, your 12-year-old will like it again, uh, numerous illustrations all the way throughout this, these three volumes, most of them from your own collection yes. and from others that you were able to borrow, I'm sure. So this is really a fascinating work. Both of these are and kind of go together in a way as, as well. Well, what we usually do is <clears throat> begin uh, the show by asking, how did you get to here? So uh, Shona, what started Civil War history in your mind? Well, I was actually a graduate student at McMaster working on my thesis, and I did a project on Andersonville Prison. And at first, I just wanted to go into the prison and sort of look at the epidemiology of the prison. What kind of diseases were these soldiers suffering from, and what kind of medical management were the soldiers receiving? And I did research all over the place, including the Anderson archives, and I found an interesting order from the Surgeon General, Samuel Preston Moore, uh, to Southern physician scientist Joseph Jones, and he said, I want you to go in with two assistants, and I want you to study the effect of these so-called uh, Southern diseases on Northern bodies. But Jones actually went in with a microscope, with a dissection kit, and, and uh, two assistants, and he set up a rudimentary little laboratory outside of the prison, and sort of instead of just looking at the anatomy and performing autopsies, he, he started thinking about disease processes and physiology and very sort of sophisticated um, questions, I thought at the time for 1861. And um, I always had the impression, this was more than 10 years ago, uh, Civil War medicine in back is so backwards. Aren't they just hacking off limbs with unsanitized equipment? And But it was actually, a, it was an investigation in a way that, that his contemporaries in Europe would understand and mirror. So I thought, I wonder if this was sort of an atypical experience. And then I started um, researching this book. Um, 
well at, at Western University actually and I know my colleagues are watching and I wanted to also say thank you to my colleagues at Western for supporting this book particularly my mentor Shelley McKellar but I, uh, I did I, I what I found was a really transformative experience for the more than 12,000 physicians that doctored on the northern side and Jones was not atypical this was actually um, a, a, a vastly and increasingly through the war scientific enterprise mm -hmm. And uh, that's really what I wanted to show. That's what inspired the book, and that's really what I wanted to show through the book. And Gordy, you've been doing this forever. Forever, uh, yes. Yeah. <laughs> and so uh, what began your collecting, being a collector as well, that's where, really where it began, I would presume. Well, what was your first thing that you collected? You wouldn't believe it. I would. <laughs> a, a Maynard carbine. Uh-huh. Uh, I was in the service. Well, these wounds had to come yeah. from somewhere. And I started, when I first started, I wanted to collect cavalry. Mm -hmm. Don't tell Marshall Crowley. I won't <laughs> but yeah, I, I, had, I had six or seven carbines, saddles, short jackets and everything. But in 1973, uh, I got sick and tired of people talking about Civil War medicine when they really didn't know much about it. As Sean had said, yeah, they, they think about lopping off arms and legs, biting bullets and things like that. So I said, I want to do a true story of Civil War medicine and tell the people really what it was all about. So I got rid of the cavalry stuff and started collecting medical items and the collection grew to 5,000 items and it metastasized all over our house. My wife's sitting <laughs> over there. And finally I got to come up with the idea to write the three books and then really an idea to start a museum, uh, yeah. which was founded in 1996 and then opened in 2000. And 2000 in Frederick, Maryland. We'll get into your uh, uh, medical museum in a moment. Um, I mean, I you know there, there's a, a Star Trek uh, series that had them come back to the 20th century. Uh, that seems a long time ago, doesn't it? 20th century. <laughs> and uh, I remember, I think Bones came in to a operating room and found. Uh, I was going to say Spock, but I think I'm wrong on that on the table. And they were just about to open up his cranium and Bones came rushing in and saying this is barbaric and he came in and he had something that he put next to uh, Spock's uh, forehead and pressed a button ah Spock got up walked away and it was fine yeah. you know <laughs> so I don't know if they're gonna say about that to us today that we're barbaric in another 150 years they just very well might but um, your books, both of them, talk about uh, something that I once came across as a freshman in Anthropology 101. <laughs> and uh, uh, Trefening, is that correct? And so it was an anthropological film that they showed us in glorious black and white of a woman in Africa who was taken up to a hillside <laughs> and she sat down on a log in the middle of uh, the felt there and the sun beating down and they started opening up her skull. She just sat there. And halfway through, they had her get up and walk under some trees to get some shade for a little while and some drink, and then back out she did. So, you know, I too began the Civil War thinking about uh, these sort of procedures happening in the war. And here is something, we'll talk about the medical and surgical records of the Civil War in a moment, but here are some skulls that are being opened and when I saw this in here, I said, well, our Civil War physicians, as this war began, letting out evil spirits even then? Is this what this is about? Is that what they were doing with this? Is the evil spirits still being, um, I'm going to show this real quickly so you can see. No, not at all. Uh, no. no, not at all. Um, this is, there's not many um, trephining uh, procedures done through the war. Um, there are a few, and they... Um, increase as the war goes on but it's what in, what's interesting about this in particular um, is they're still initially when they begin inadvertently spreading disease by 1865 they're now talking about the importance of disinfection of equipment um, in this particular case but here it's just they're trying to extract a bullet well uh, that and to relieve the pressure yeah. on the brain if you have a, a fracture of the, the cranium and it's, ca it's causing pressure on the brain they have to relieve that and we in neurosurgery they do that today with 
specialized types of insulin and sterile things like that but it's mainly to relieve the pressure on the brain cap. well that's mm -hmm. how dr leo found abraham lincoln's wound mm -hmm. uh, mm -hmm. finally got around to the back of his head and and put his little finger in there he said and relieved the pressure that's how some blood got out you say shauna in your book that uh, there were 200 cases of peeping performed <clears throat> a 43 percent survivor rate that's not bad how huh? how successful overall were army doctors for a variety of wounds that they saw the huge variety how successful were they overall it's see I, I i get that question quite a bit it's it's hard to talk in terms of of successes um we are still looking at seven hundred and fifty thousand fatalities from this war in just four years a number that's proportional to 7.5 million today so what i talk about in my book is there are successes um, through the war, and we do see the incidence of uh, treatment of wound trauma and, and treatment of specific diseases um, improve as management strategies themselves improve through the war. One in particular I like to talk about is gangrene and erysipelas because they do conduct um, experiments through the war and they talk about the efficacy of disinfectants and why disinfectants work. So, um, they start to see the contagiousness of disease and lots of doctors are writing and submitting case reports based on um, a circular that's issued in late 1862 by Ham Hammond and Middleton Goldsmith and what they start to say is submit your experiences with these disease um, and give an idea of what is working for you. So they debate things like nitric acid and permanganate of potassa and uh, bromine is seen as something of a miracle drug. So they start to write and they say, we're actually having success putting bromine in empty quinine bottles and saucers under beds. We're treating it locally on the wound as soon as any sign of uh, infection appears. And this is stopping it somehow from spread spreading into the bloodstream. We, they refer to this as pyemia, but it's through the war and then a record of experience. The most interesting thing, one of the most interesting things is everything is widely recorded and disseminated through the war. Mm -hmm. So I talk about circular number two and they circular say- Circular number two was put out by whom? William Hammond. Uh, in, and he was? He was the Surgeon General of mm -hmm. the Union Army. Mm -hmm. And it's only been a month, it was only a month after he received his appointment that he actually issued this circular. Why did he and, do that? How did he come up with that idea? Um, I think the idea of uh, collecting specimens and creating a medical museum is something that had carried over from other wars, inc including the Crimean War. Yeah, yeah. But there was this idea that these lessons that we're going to be learning um, should not be lost. And it started out small. It was a few physicians uh, submitting specimens. But we have this here. I don't know if you can see. But this just gives you an example um, at the very back you can see the index of reporters. So each, each name, there's, it's listed alphabetically, and then each name in the back of the index has a corresponding page number, and that might be a case report or a specimen that was submitted into the Army Medical Museum. And within each one of these volumes, there's maybe 3,000 uh, reporters, and many, many more cases exist uh, and were submitted to the Army Medical Museum and never made it in. Uh, this volume. So there was this idea that these lessons that we're going to be learning can't be lost. And so to go back to, the, to gangrene and bromine and learning through the war, in 1863, that right through the war there was a 94-page document published that said this is what we're finding works and this is what you need to do and then it was widely disseminated. So there were some cases where we see uh, better successes as the war went on and there were others that we don't, we still, as I said, had 750,000, but experience taught, and they did learn as they went along and tried to widely transmit the, the, these, these successful uh, treatments. 